just going to Azure user group meeting. meeting. This is the, the typical, typical meeting we do every we do second every Tuesday of the month. Of the month. And as, and I, always as say, I always say, if you ever have any topics, have any topics or, presentation or presentation that you'd like to, you'd give, like to give, feel free to reach out to, to one, one of the organizers. Of the organizers. Uh, I'm Brian, I'm Brian. I'm one of the organizers. Kim, Kim Tassaris, Tassaris, who may have welcomed you in. in. We're also one of the organizers. Matt is on the organization team. John is, Mike is, who was just up here. So luckily we've got a great team that we can kind of do a lot of these presentations for. Our goal is to just help educate the community a little bit, right? So it may not be exactly what we do every day with Microsoft Azure, because there are so many that you can do with it. With it. But maybe you'll pick maybe up you'll something pick up that you can take, home, take and learn. home and learn. And again, if you again, want to get specific, get specific on one topic, topic you can either, either present, present or, you can, or you can ask us to bring in experts, experts because we have a lot, of, a lot, of, uh, a lot of ties, a lot of channels through the various team members, team members that we can bring in people who maybe specialize in data lake or something if needed. So thanks for being part of the group. Here is where I was going to thank Kim and our hosts. We'll come back to that. She's not here. But like I said, rough agenda. We're kind of into the main presentation item section. And our goal today is to talk about the best of Microsoft Build 2023. Who here, who here attended Microsoft Build? Anybody? Remember, you can do it online. Okay, a couple. Cool. Virtual or in person? In person. Awesome. How was it? It was great. Okay. Do you want to give this talk instead of me because you were there? <laughs> I want to compare and contrast. Okay. All right. Well, good. Good. Um, there she is. So everyone, please, round of applause for Kim and OST for providing the snacks and beverages. Thank you very much, OST and Kim. Uh, and uh, the Michigan State representative, I think, is over there, or Spartan Innovations. We want to thank Spartan Innovations for hosting us as well. This is a fantastic space. Very excited to be here. Um, so I think that's all the intros we need. So we can get right to it. Oh, wait, no, before we get right to it. Let me explain. At the various tables, I have dropped sticky notepad things and pens and markers. You have homework in this session. The goal I want to do is make it a little interactive at the end. So I'm going to review 10 of the amazing things that Microsoft announced during Build. Remember which one is your favorite. That's one item. What is your favorite thing we're discussing today? Or if I didn't cover it, because there actually is more than 10 things they announced, and you know something else that was really interested in you, write it down as your favorite item to, to put up. And we're going to put them on the board and just see what kind of uh, commonalities we have. And then second, this is a harder one, which one of the items is going to have the most impact a year from now in the tech world, right? So not necessarily just your organization, but like think like global tech world. Which one of these new technologies in a year from now are we going to be saying, Oh my gosh, this is so amazing. I'm so happy that we have this tool or this platform or this framework or whatever it is. So two things, your favorite and the one that will make the most impact. Is that easy enough? I hope we're not, we're not you know, quizzing anyone. There's no grades. It's just to see what commonalities we have. And I thought it'd be kind of cool to vote on those things. That's a good question. Yeah, because it'd be like, what, November, October, when it really started to blow up last year, yeah. maybe? I'm just curious if anybody saw that conference, because uh, that's the coolest thing I've experienced. Yeah, yeah. So there you go. OK. Uh, in case you didn't know, I hope you do, because you're here at this session, Microsoft Build is one of the largest uh, developer-ish type conferences that Microsoft puts on. They put on two major ones, or maybe more, depending on how you slice it. but. Build historically has been about developers and developer efficiency and tools that speak to them. Ignite is the other one. It historically has been a little bit more around uh, IT admin pros um, and other non-developer things. But actually now they kind of cross and merge topics because I just think that's where the technology space is going these days. And there might be other partner things that I'm forgetting. But to me, I don't know if John or Mike, the, those, the two big ones basically, Build and Ignite. Yeah, then there's the worldwide part of the thing, but I'm skipping all that. But. So anyways, Microsoft Build happened. It was in May, so we're a little bit behind. But the cool thing about not doing this right away is actually we can see some of the content that other people are generating around some of these topics and tools. So it gives us a better, deeper picture. And I'm hoping to bring some of that as I did some research for this talk to show you just not just say, hey, here's this cool thing. It's here's this cool thing, and here's how you might use it. Here's how one person uses it. So that's kind of one of my other goals for today. All right. So uh, this guy, CEO of Microsoft, uh, the biggest thing at Microsoft builds AI. 
and the way you could basically say it is it's AI everywhere. And it's never going away at this point, as, as far as you're concerned, if you're Microsoft. Um, and um, thank you very much for my presentation. Any questions? <laughs> Seriously, you can sum up Microsoft Build as AI everywhere. Um, it's something that they've been working on in almost every product line, whether it's pure development, things that we're used to and familiar with, like Visual Studio or VS Code, all the way up the stack of application level, like Microsoft Office, Windows, CRM. They're putting AI into darn near everything when it comes to this technology. So they spent the rest of the session after that announcement going into where all those things are, and that's a lot of what we're gonna cover today. In case you weren't familiar also with this, uh, Microsoft also does this thing called the Book of News. I have to credit the Book of News for almost all of the things I'm gonna tell you because it's a nice recap of here are all of the announcements. It's one web page and one download you can get to to actually see like everything and actually get to like well, if they're talking about this new thing, here's where I can learn more. So I do recommend, if you're curious about this afterwards, you know, grab this link. We'll put it up in the recording uh, on the YouTube channel as well. Um, but the Book of News has all of the announcements in one place, and I think it's, it's meant for, like, therefore other places can pick it up and use it to say what happens. And I did that as well. Anybody familiar with Book of News? All right, cool. A couple people in the room. All right, first item, one of the first things around Microsoft Build, the biggest announcement has to come down to we're adding AI into Bing. In case you don't know, Microsoft really backed OpenAI from the beginning, and they have some kind of exclusive access to it, I think is a short way to say it. So they've been working with it the longest compared to anyone. And uh, if you are at all familiar with chat GP GPT, um, what is the biggest limitation of that system in the back. Old data, correct. The model, the large language model that powers ChatGPT is set in stone at a, at a period of time that actually is September 2021. So when you ask it things about current events or happenings that just kind of recently have occurred since 2021, you get answers like this. Hey, as an AI, I actually can't answer you. It's a short way to say all of this text. It is interesting that it will attempt things, and here's one of the you know slight gotchas of these tools, is they sound very confident in almost every answer they give you, right? Even though they might be wrong. Uh, and it's sometimes hard to understand if they're wrong or not, but um, the reason I'm bringing this up is this is the experience you would have gotten with ChatGPT prior to, I don't know, about a month and a half ago ish, depending on if you are a premium subscriber and if you're in preview, all the other variables. But the announcement here is that now the tool um, has new abilities around communicating with plugins. And browsing uh, is one of the main plugins that it was added. So now if you ask that same question with plugins to either chat GPT or Bing, you'll get a much different answer. In fact, you'll get a very accurate answer, an accurate answer so much that I didn't actually want you to be able to read all the other nine things that I'm gonna talk about. Uh, just kidding, I didn't actually just copy and paste the other nine things. But it's showing that we actually are using not only the large language model of um, the GPT models, but we're also combining it with internet browsing. Uh, and we're doing that behind the scenes a lot with the connections between Bing and OpenAI and Microsoft, okay? So to show it in one more way, it's not just ChatGTP, it's also the fact that this is now one of the main interfaces in Bing. Yes, RAG, Retrieval Augmented Generation. I will get into that in a little bit, so that's a great comment, but hold that, please. So um, you'll notice, actually, raise your hands. How many people in the room use Bing as their main search engine? Okay, we got about 10%, pretty good. I would have guessed zero last year, right? To Mike's earlier point, this stuff is revolutionizing and giving us new experiences. And one of the things that Microsoft did right around this time of build was basically build and launch a new Bing, which has a chat, almost a chat first experience to it. I'm just curious if that number would have been the same last year or different. People have raised their hand that like you in the last few months. Or in the Yeah. 
Yeah, so just for the recording, the question was around how many people a year ago would have been using a combination like Edge and Bing as their default. Yep. And also note the answer that Bing is giving out here to the question of what is the uh, what are the best highlights of Microsoft Build 2023? One of the big things that's added is the uh, ability of citations. So at the bottom we have one, two, three as footnotes and three more. Those citations are part of the retrieval process that we'll talk about in a second to augment the answer that the um, model is giving you. So um, that's something that they didn't used to do when it first came out, like last November, like when we were talking. And that's going to be really relevant when we get to some of the other items about your data versus this data. So. Awesome, awesome. In case you're listening and you can't hear Mike, he works at Microsoft, and he was mentioning how this was used internally uh, for the Azure Docs uh, before release to the public, which is kind of cool. Because that is a problem when you don't know. They, they will make stuff up. Oh, yeah, kind of yeah. And you have no idea what the base is. Mm -hmm. So it's nice to see that. Um, OK, so uh, chat GPT like experience in Bing. Really, that's the first item that, that made a big splash at the conference. Um, and we actually saw this also at the Microsoft MVP Summit prior to, to build as well. Very cool. I remember being in the room with about, I don't know, 700 other people, and little gasps were, were coming out of people's mouths as they were watching the video of, of this happening. So that was pretty cool. All right, now, say you wanted to do that on your own, and you didn't want to rely on Bing or ChatGPT uh, with uh, OpenAI's solution. Here is where Azure AI Studio comes in as our second announcement for Microsoft Build. Azure AI Studio is a tool that you can basically log into and use today, and it allows you to start developing your own chat experiences. And these experiences, um, still look mostly like a you know a chat bot, but behind the scenes they allow you to do a lot more. They allow you to even like upload your own data sets and to do what's actually called grounding, um, which I do have a demo of. If we have time, I'm going to save demos to the end because I want to actually make sure we get through the ten items, and I'm already running low on time. Uh, but basically, Azure AI Studio uh, is is a starting point for. I want to build something on my own. I want to connect it to my own organization's data. And I want to use the power of uh, GT, GPT Turbo or GPT, GPT-4 connected to my data set. I don't want to just look at the public data set that it was trained on, because maybe I'm a hospital system. And I have a lot of medical documents and terms, and I need to make sure it's protected by just my information, not just a general WebMD answer that could get me in trouble. right? So that's a common one. Um, you may want to train it on a large set of PDFs that you have in your organization. As long as that's in Azure Blob Storage, you can basically point Azure AI Studio at your data set, and it will ground that data to the answer. And on top of that, you can even make limits with this, uh, which we'll talk even more about later, with the system message. And you can like change the major behavior of the way the chat agent responds to you. And you can put rules in there. And it's called the system message. And uh, we'll talk about that too. But uh, this is a very quick and easy way to start playing with um, Azure's version of OpenAI that is then safe to use in your projects. You could put this on your website. You could put this in your internal intranet. Um, it's something that you can start embedding and adding to your solutions. And it lets you start doing that as a developer because you, you can actually see there's like a view code button or show the, the JSON, and it will actually show you the JSON you need to interact at an API level with 
the endpoints that you expose when you spin up a Azure OpenAI instance in the Azure portal or however you do it. Um, Yeah, it's it's almost more like a developer console uh, in in the portal world of Azure in a way. Um, you can also do more than just chat. You can do um, image generation, so generative AI through Dolly uh, is a bit, you can actually click into there and type in a phrase, and it will start generating images that match that phrase. So you can play with it in here. It's it's the playground is really a great way to think of it because it's you're not going to like build and launch a ton of stuff here necessarily. But if you need to do some quick testing and you see how things are working, this is a great spot to start. It's kind of like the entry point into the whole madness that is AI. Um, hope I didn't offend anyone with the madness term, but that's how I feel about it sometimes. So Azure AI Studio was launched, and um, the Azure Data Preview is one of the places where you can actually connect it to something like if you're using Azure Search or other Cosmos DB um, instances, and it will just start bringing that in you create an index, you define how it wants to be used as content, and then it starts becoming part of the result sets, and it will even cite the PDF documents at the bottom, like, like the Bing example was doing uh, for that. So I've used it a ton uh, so far, and I even gave a quick tech talk about just this um, at a conference last two weeks ago. So this is pretty cool. It's a great place to start, which is why I'm highlighting it. Any questions on Azure AI Studio? If there's time, does anybody want to see a demo at the end? All right, cool. We got a couple. Okay. Up next, not quite the rise of the resistance. So I was in Disney last month. Took the family there. It was awesome. Highly recommend that. Uh, but I call it the rise of the co-pilots. And again, this is part of the AI everywhere theme. Co-pilots. Who uses GitHub Copilot in the room? Couple. So if you're not familiar with it, GitHub Copilot is basically if you're a developer writing C Sharp or JavaScript or Node or whatever, you can actually hit Tab, and the Copilot will suggest the code that it thinks you need next. And frankly, it went from being annoying when it was first launched to pretty darn accurate today. A lot of people use it. We have it for everybody at my company pretty much. And uh, it's a time saver. It's not perfect, but it's something that really helps out. So they took that success because a ton of people use GitHub Copilot. It's in, it fully integrated in VS Code. It's fully integrated in Visual Studio. They took that, that idea and that success, and they're adding it into the rest of the Microsoft ecosystem and platforms and applications. So instead of me maybe saying every single thing about it, I thought this quick one-minute video did a better job because you can kind of see it in action. And um, frankly, it's pretty darn cool. So I'm going to play that, and I really hope that the sound works. Let me actually check the sound. We're going to go up way higher than that. Have you ever wanted to know how large language models work when you connect them to the data in your organization? At Microsoft, we recently demonstrated Microsoft 365 Copilot, which transforms how we work by leveraging large language models that interact with your organizational data. Copilot works alongside you. For example, in Word, Copilot can easily write an entirely new document, like a business proposal, using content from your existing files or an Outlook based on content you select, Copilot can compose your email replies for you. In PowerPoint, you can transform your written content into a visually beautiful presentation with a click of a button. In Teams, Copilot can generate meeting summaries with discussed follow-up actions. Or while using business chat in Microsoft Teams, it can help you catch up on something you may have missed, bringing together information from multiple sources to bring you up to speed. If you're wondering how large language models know what they know in these scenarios. All right, so that's it. We're not going to watch eight minutes, obviously, of a video. But pretty cool showcase of the things it can start doing right in the native apps. Has anyone used any of that stuff yet? I'll be honest, I haven't either. Um, so I do hear a lot of things like, with a click of a button, it will do all this. Does that make anyone nervous in the room? Okay, yeah. Yeah, one customer. Sweet, sweet. I, I think the potential is incredibly high. I just think it's so early on. Like, how accurate can it possibly be? But you can say, what are the meeting notes? I'll bring it and send the meeting notes. 
part of it. So that's really cool. Yeah, I've heard that's really good. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's kind of a weird. Yeah. So, so Mike's comment is Microsoft is going to be actually um, dedicating maybe or specializing in co-pilot CSAs who will help your organization come in and set this up and make sure you're using it correctly. Okay. Nope, did that already. Uh, so, as I just kind of alluded to, one click of a button will write your whole email. One click of a thing will generate a whole Word document, and it's a sales proposal. A lot of crazy cool possibilities, but with great power comes great responsibility, right? What if you're worried about the terminology uh, in these things? What if you're worried about um, people abusing them in the wrong way? Especially when you get into, like I said, the hospital situation. Or they maybe have like a wellness and and child care and <clears throat> women's care and sexual health as a really valid topic that you do want to have in uh, the ability of your question and answer bot or your chat agent, right? But on other sites, some of those terms you're throwing around in that area, you sure as heck would not want to be on your corporate website or your corporate intranet, right? So Microsoft was really big in, in talking about this idea of responsible AI. And Responsible AI gives you the ability to not only know that your data is private and secure inside of the Azure cloud, but also for you to actually tweak the filtering level of what content can be allowed in the responses of AI, what can be generated, um, what will be accepted as a question or a prompt, as it's called, into the chat. And this screenshot kind of shows the, uh, the new ability of Azure AI content safety. And content safety really is filtering around hate um, uh, as, a, as a concept in your writing, you know, sexual terms, self-harm, and violence. And they may add other categories further on down the road, but it allows you to say, like, maybe I'm in that special healthcare situation and I do want to allow uh, a couple of these terms to, at a different level than other people would. So this is something you can start adding on uh, and, and kind of being a little bit more secure uh, in, in the content that it's going to generate and have more control over that which is, I think, important uh, because all this stuff is moving very, very fast. As we said, AI has really only been around since last October-ish to the public, and the more time there is, the more human things may become, and the, the skeptic in me you know, worries about could this get out of control in some certain situations. So I think, uh, uh, in personal opinion, I applaud my stuff for doing this, to, to add in the ability to have these filters and tweak it down to your audience and who you want to. So um, does that make sense? That is that is interesting. Yeah, the opportunity to put high is uh, for hate. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, now I've kind of said pros and cons, right? It could generate things with one click, and then we have to be careful about what we generate. Out of all the stuff that the first video showed, it didn't to me show the coolest thing that I saw uh, out of build, and well, one of the cool things I saw out of build, uh, and that's actually this. Where this stuff really starts to take off, in my opinion, is uh, analytics. The next generation of AI in Microsoft Power BI. Copilot in Power BI empowers your people to unlock the full potential of your data and move from data to insights faster. Now, with Copilot in Power BI, you can use natural language to bring your data to life. Simply describe the visuals and insights you're looking for, and next generation AI will create your report and help you refine it. You can then dig into this data further by asking a question, and Copilot will find the best answer. Not only does Copilot help you visualize your data, but it taps into Power BI's advanced analysis capabilities to help you find key influencers and outliers and create forecasts. Copilot can summarize your data into easy to understand text narratives that help others quickly get important and relevant insights. And for analysts who are creating calculations and modeling data, you can simply describe what you want and the code is automatically generated. 
With Copilot in Power BI, turning data into impact has never been easier. All right. Anyone in the room ever work in Power BI? Anyone in the room like working with Power BI? Yeah, okay, that's a maybe. <laughs> Is it yes? Yeah. Why do you like working in Power BI? It is rather simple. Um, the engineer allowed things like the uh, yeah. loading data from the top of the And I agree. I think it does a fantastic job of that. In fact, we do it quite a bit at BizStream. Um, what do you think about this? seeing the fact that you can just start typing in things and have it generate visualizations for you. They have iterations of it, so this is a lot as you see when you try to you know, take out a much easier version by just definitely being part of uh, YouTube. Yeah, so for those of you watching the recording, his face is smiling, right? And this is a positive thing, um, and I agree. It got me excited too, because I, I have seen success with Power BI, and I've actually been the most frustrated person ever after working on it for like a year-long project. Um, it's the little last steps that are like sometimes the really hard parts. Uh, if they can nail this, I think this is going to be huge for a lot of businesses and organizations who can't necessarily afford a data analyst or they don't know how to pull together multiple data sources from various places and generate analytics just on the fly. Um, I think that's a super powerful thing, and that's why this, this one to me is one of my favorite ones. Um, but that's cool. Cool that you're excited about it as well. So I'm not, hopefully not too far off. I'm not gonna watch that again. Okay. So uh, this next one is more about uh, the ability to control these prompts and what they do next. Right now, it feels a little bit like a black box, right? We ask a question into chat GPT or Bing and we get answers and we get them fast, relatively speaking. But what if we need to do something very specific and look at multiple sources and control that flow because we're an organization who wants to provide a service like this? Prompt Flow is a tool that was just released at Build that allows prompt engineers, which is almost, in a way, a new field, uh, or developers or uh, people who work with data, uh, to customize the process of from input to output and take actions and steps and make a flow hence prompt flow, uh, of how intelligent and how the decisions are made from the AI workflow, basically. So one of the ways to look at it is this, this little chart, this little workflow thing. So from the input, which is the question, and the question in this case is, when did OpenAI announce GPT-4? And this is showing that, all right, I'm going to go out and I'm going to get the URL to Wikipedia, and I'm going to use Wikipedia as my source. I'm then going to perform a search from the Wikipedia URL that I just got, and I'm going to pass it maybe that question or pass it a, a phrase of that question. And then when that comes back from Wikipedia via a request, I'm going to process all those results, and I'm going to try to scrape the information as opposed to the HTML page. I'm going to try to get that information out as natural language. I'm then going to pass that to the large language model, and then finally it will go with a, the augmented question and answer and the output. And the output actually tells the answer of November uh, 2022, uh, as I think the final answer to that. But at each step of the way, when you click the flow, you highlight this one actually. So I've clicked Get Wiki URL. It's highlighting this. And it will actually show you the Python code that this, this is a template that's already like a starter uh, place for you to start from. Um, it'll show you the Python code, and you can manipulate it, or you could write your own code. You'd also start from scratch and not use any of this and go from input to output. And this is really how you would sort of finally control prompts and also importantly test them in bulk as opposed to like literally being a person who sits there over and over writing the same question and making sure the answer is right. You actually do a bulk test, throw out a bunch of questions, and you can see those results. It also let you debug and step through the process if it's slow. Like if the response is slow, it's probably frustrating to your users. So this is a very powerful part of actual the machine learning studio in Azure. Uh, I actually set this up last night, this exact example, and um, we can get to it if we need to. But there's a question in the back. This might be a dumb question, but is this stuff that can be in like GLC pipelines or? Uh, that is a great question. The question is, can this be in CI/CD pipelines? 
Parts of it I have seen where it's basically like YAML and JSON, and I feel like it could. Other parts, I'm not sure they're there yet. A lot of this is connectivity to, you first need a compute resource to run the actual processing, so you have to spin that up. Then you need a connection to one of your sources, and there's a lot of like pushing pieces. In fact, the only way to make this work is to first have an Azure OpenAI resource that you point the prompt flow at, then you spin up a virtual machine to run the compute. So it's like a pretty, yeah, yeah. So I, I bet uh, if John was here, maybe through Bicep you could do it all. But that I, I'll be honest, I don't know that answer for sure. I'm just kind of speculating. I don't know if you've heard of that, Matt, at all. Like, yeah. Yeah. My thought on this is even does it have to be that exact value to be able to give off that flow? No. So if it's something similar like an AI analysis tool, so it uses that language model to try to figure out what you're trying to ask it and then it kicks off the flow? Or um, no, so the it's an input. And the input is a, is in this case just a string value. Oh, so it's any anything. Oh, anything. anything. I was just curious on how it yeah, how it works. Yeah. Yes, exactly. You can basically read and understand certain things, and maybe instead of, you want to actually merge it with an Azure Search Index, with Azure Cognitive Search, and your Cosmos DB, and your file system, and your SharePoint intranet. You can just keep writing extra steps in the middle to refine and refine and refine, or maybe bail out and actually start back up here. So it's an actual full like workflow system that's very powerful and allows you to control like every part of it. Whereas the first thing, like going back to the previous one with just the uh, Azure AI Studio, that's more of a make one connection and that's it. This is like the taking that to steroids, in my opinion, and giving you inputs and outputs and writing your own functions and debug and trace and log and all that stuff is in here. Pretty much. Yeah, I mean, you could. Yeah, yeah. So very cool if you're interested at all in this stuff. I highly recommend taking the time to learn it. Uh, switching gears a little bit now, uh, moving a little bit away from AI and just other things around Build highlights and announcements. One of them is called Dev Home. Dev Home was announced at Build this year. Uh, has anyone in the audience heard of Dev Home? Matt? Oh, yesterday, okay. Oh, I didn't even see that, so that was, yeah. So basically, it's a way to set up developer boxes for your projects. Uh, and it runs in your Windows workstation. And it's the value here is bringing up projects quickly, uh, bringing developers up to speed quickly on projects, and having a kind of controlled dashboard of all the steps, workflow actions, CICD deployments, GitHub project issues. It's like your developer dashboard on your workstation. And you can combine all of these projects in your dashboard. You can set up this configuration. So this dashboard is actually showing, you know, I have a GitHub issue widget there in the center. I've got some uh, PR review requested as another thing. Like all the things that are assigned to me, waiting for me. Here's my machine's performance at the moment. You can kind of customize this and bring in any, any of these widgets that you want to to make this a very personalized dashboard. So if you're someone who doesn't necessarily care about the resources of the memory and CPU, you could get rid of those and just bring in more GitHub projects. Especially if those of you have like multiple GitHub accounts for like various clients and then personal and then work, you can bring it all into one place here. Um, and then also you can set up the, um, on top of Dev Home, you can set up the Dev Box, which is actually more of the workstation setup. Uh, in my opinion, this is a lot like basically just having a, um, a container going already. Um, but it's a little bit of improvement, and it basically allows you to just set up the, these boxes along with um, uh, the resources that you want them appropriate to, to with like your other teammates and colleagues. 
Uh, and I'll be honest, this is very, very new. And that is about the edge of my understanding on it. And if anyone else in the room knows more about this, now would be the time to speak up. Um, but I do see that it's being a very cool like developer productivity thing for uh, us uh, C Sharper .NET developers, or I guess front end developers as well. But um, so that wasn't it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and it does. It, it somewhat ties more natively to Azure than if you're doing all this stuff yourself through win just Windows. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. Again, uh, next thing, as I mentioned, AI everywhere. Copilots, the rise of the copilots. Here's the next one. So Windows 11 and Edge natively integrated into Windows. Instead of being at like a <coughs> application level. Sorry, should definitely be drinking more beer. Instead of at the application level, this is now at the operating system level. Asking the copilot questions about your OS. Um, uh, adjust my settings so I can focus is one example. I do believe I have a, so here, I didn't find a ton of information about this and I don't have access to it yet, but this is one of the better things that basically what happened in this scenario, that's Windows Explorer. They dragged a PDF out of Windows Explorer called Contoso Business Plan. They dropped it in the prompt of the question and it basically just summarized what was in that PDF. Instead of having to read it, it just did that for you right from Windows Explorer. This one, maybe not as excited about because, I don't know, I don't do that very often, I guess. Uh, but it is an improvement coming in Windows 11. I don't think it's GA yet. No. Yeah, yeah. Still working on it, obviously. Uh, okay. Now, uh, away from apps and Windows and developers, more to uh, data. A big announcement was Microsoft Fabric. Fabric brings together, as you can see, Power BI, Synapse, Data Factory, uh, all of basically the boxes in the blue chart, uh, and it makes them almost like a out-of-the-box configuration. It makes them easier to use together and combine to, as it says, make it a single integrated environment. Again, this is kind of not my wheelhouse, this specific part of Azure or tech. So has anybody heard of Fabric? Okay, a couple. Kinda. I think I heard that. Yeah, I like I like how they termed it like a SaaS foundation. I think it's almost like data on demand to be able to spin all this stuff up. If you're a large organization and you need a ton of analytical data, um, I, I think that this is this is not for the small business by any means. Really, this is enterprise type stuff for sure. Um, but if you want to know more, I did put the link on this one about you know more about what Fabric is because again, this is not my specialty at all. But a big announcement according to the people who use it. That reminds me, we actually had a member of the group reach out to me about speaking about one of these. I think it was Synapse. So that actually is coming up in the fall. We'll call it the fall. Uh, one of the fall sessions, We've he actually has a conflict that we got to figure out. He got back to me today on that. Um, but we do have a presentation coming on this, and I'm excited for it because I will learn a ton from that for sure. All right. We're getting near the end. Doing terrible on time, but Power Apps and Power Virtual Agents. Is anyone into a low code, no code? Mike is cool. All right, we got a couple. So, Power Apps is basically Microsoft's version of low code, no code, and Power Virtual Agents um, basically give you like the center of this screen. So, you can actually go into the Power Apps world, fire it up, and you, in theory, can start typing, I want to create an app for an employee management system. What that will do is actually start walking you through, well, what kind of data and tables does this system need to store? And it will literally, with your co-pilot, uh, walk you through some of the setup steps, ask you questions, and give you the ability to customize it and basically say, yeah, I'd like to add a column or two to what this application tracks. 
and behind the scenes, it's gonna generate an application for you, which is kind of scary for people who have built their careers on generating custom applications, but uh, seeing it in action was pretty cool, and it is a, a, a major improvement to the Power Apps uh, solution itself. So after you like get through, like I need to add a row of data, I need to change this to that, it starts generating those things, and you can actually create app and preview your app that it would create for you. Basically, more co-pilots to do things for you, uh, which I think is pretty cool. And on top of that, uh, here's another quick like one-minute version of this for Power Pages. Power Pages is building a website, not just an app. Uh, and this is actually pretty cool. Next generation AI in Power Pages is revolutionizing how you build and launch data-centric websites for your business. Instead of spending hours crafting and coding websites, you can use natural language and intelligent suggestions to speed up your website building process. Now with Copilot and Power Pages, you can generate text, build forms, activate chatbots, and enable site design in seconds. All through the power of AI using natural language commands. Start building today with the go-to low-code tool that will help your organization. All right, so that was the main benefit of seeing Power Pages. Pretty cool, I think. Um, yeah, it's not. Uh, not for the type of websites that, that I built, but uh, we're going to skip past. I, but I think for, for quick, uh, smaller things, it could be amazing. All right, so that's 10 things that happened at Microsoft Build. As I said at the beginning, I hope people remember this. Think about the two questions I asked you, which was, of these 10 topics that we just reviewed, what were your favorite out of the 10? Or fav what, was your, what was your favorite? Wow. And what was the one that a year from now you think will still have like the biggest impact uh, of the tools? And here's where I think we need some Jeopardy music. That's it. Um, so that was as far as my plan went to, Mike, to be honest. And um, yeah, we could actually put it up on that board over there. Or we could just put it on like this table too. And then um, we could also just go around the room and say it too. I, anybody have a preference? I have a question. A question, okay. Uh, for Dev Home, I saw that they integrated really well on GitHub. Yes. Do you know if that integrates with like your Azure resources or Azure DevOps? Uh, Azure DevOps, yes, I believe. You're like just straight up Azure resources. I don't think so. Maybe. I just figured it'd be a nice for like monitoring things. Right. Right. Uh, and I think you could actually make custom widgets, which feel like you could roll your own to do that. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Fantastic answer. Um. Any opinions on that? Do we want to just kind of go around the room quickly, or do we actually want to put them up on a board and take a picture? Or any? We also use the window because the windows. Uh, actually, let's not stick stuff on there. Nice clean windows. Um, all right, we'll just go around the room. That way, we don't have to move people around a ton. And uh, I do want to keep a tally of which one wins, though. So, any volunteers to? take the note on the names, of how many times the name is mentioned. All right, thanks, Mike. Okay, uh, who wants to start? I'm taking those off, though. Okay. I think that uh, Azure Studio is my favorite thing I've ever built back. Which one? The AI Studio? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Jim, you want to go next? Yeah, I went with uh, the favorite was number one. And uh, most impactful, I think, was the uh, uh, three Okay, okay. Guys? Number four, okay, okay. My favorite depends on which perspective is personal or work. Let's go personal. Personal favorite. We'll go personal. Yeah. Right, right. 
Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and hopefully they're smart enough to use it in a way because it can explain in English what this code is doing. Right. Hopefully they're using that as well too. Yep, very well said. Yep. And if you chat like the whole AI, yeah. it, um, that's exactly the problem that in my world as like an advisor, a chat GPT is a lot better because you can go in and just type it up all the through your answer and it's clearly wrong. It's just like, well, it's one of the things, so the other thing that, you know, you're talking about the content and safety and all that. One of the big things that, I mean, I've heard there continually was just what it said. Don't don't just make the assumption that it is going to be the answer and it's going to be correct every time. It is make sure that you understand what it's doing, why it's doing it, all those kind of things like that, and make the appropriate adjustments. Yep. 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 Most people ask them questions are not taught. Yeah. And, and it's well worth telling you whatever it's yeah. like telling you to a student or to the instructor not to teach. I think that one of the things that you're gonna see in the coming years is really what Thank you. Great comments. Uh, Matt, I'll go to you. Yeah, so my personal favorite one is the chat calm feature. Um, I, I really love the ability to basically script their entire development environment. You can check that in on source control. Um, they're doing a POC with GitHub Enterprise, and so I, I see all of this stuff playing together really nicely. If I could just script as a principal engineer all of the development setup that a new developer would need, and I'd hand that to them and say, all right, here you go. That would give them all the tools that they need to install all the right you know, softwares and the right Visual Studio. So I, I think that would be huge for me. It would take away a, a big part of the setup process. As far as what I think it would be the most impactful, I think the big chat, chat GPT OpenAI plugin, because that extends not just in the workplace, but there are people who are less tech savvy that I see tend to be into that space a little bit who are just really interested about it. And so I, I think that's going to be huge. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, my personal favorite is the Jet Palm. I just see myself using that since I work in microservices. I have like 30 repos I have to manage my time. Oh, yeah. So that's going to be really nice to see that all in one view. Awesome. Uh, you want to do a presentation on it later this year? <laughs> Maybe. Yeah. All right. Okay. Um, biggest impact is uh, Microsoft 365 profile. I just see myself using that for Teams and Outlook, uh, replying to emails. Meeting notes, summaries, yeah. Summaries, yeah. 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 Really yep, totally agree. Totally agree. Cameron? Yeah. Uh, a lot of good 
good ones. I went with a favorite that with this AI studio, I think uh, there's a lot of good things you can do internally with that. Um, stuff that you might not necessarily want published in front of the world. Like the control you have on that is pretty sweet. Uh, and also that dev home kind of got me thinking of maybe we, we all can do managed services. So I'm wondering if setting up workstations for new employees or mm -hmm. different depending on different positions, uh, depending on what they need, that, that might be something to keep working to. Um, same thing with development boxes. But yeah, cool stuff. I think the most impactful, just in the broader sense, is the thing that you see with how broad their stuff is going to be and what people are going to do with their. Cool. 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 Gentlemen, next to Cameron. <laughs> Sorry, I don't need him. <laughs> Awesome. Yep. Couldn't agree more. Uh, close the guy in the hat. All right, we'll go, we'll go this way next, and then we'll circle the back to me. So for me, Microsoft Fabric is definitely going to be my row. Uh, you know, there. And then probably just by co-pilot, Nice. Yeah. 
Right, right. Good point, good point. Right? Awesome, awesome. Yeah, definitely, definitely. All right, save the best for last. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. All right. One last thing, Mike. Tallies, totals, winner. Do we have a winner? Hey. Hey. Okay. Well, I think I gotta say, I for one welcome our co-pilot overlords. <laughs> That's it, everybody. Thank you very much for participating. Uh, we've got some stuff left over. Kim, do we have a hard time on the room at six? Or okay, okay, cool. So we can hang out. Yeah, just want to make sure that we weren't like.